You might think of Dave Matthews Band as an early 90s phenomenon, unless you're a hardcore fan who knew that they've toured almost every single summer since they formed in 1992, except for a pause in 2020, and are one of the top five tour ticket sellers around the world. In fact, they have such a loyal tour following that every summer fans gather for a three-day show called Labor Dave Weekend. Critics of the group lump them in with other jam bands like the Grateful Dead and Fish. In fact, some of their fans even are former Deadheads who joined the fold after Jerry Garcia's passing in 1995. Yet there's something truly unique about their sound whether you're a fan or you're not. In a 2004 Driven VH1 documentary about the group, Fish's Trey Anastasio would talk about the first time he heard Dave Matthews perform, saying, I thought he was incredible. I knew the minute I saw him perform that he was going places. Undoubtedly, a huge influence on the band's sound is Dave's dual upbringing in South Africa and the United States. He even considered naming his band Damwala, which means hello in a local South African language. In a 1996 interview with the Baltimore Sun, Dave would state, I keep trying not to follow in the footsteps, but follow in the spirit of people that have inspired me. People like Bob Marley, people like Abdullah Ibrahim or Keith Jarrett, stuff like that. Born in 1967 to a Quaker family in a suburb outside of Johannesburg to a physicist father and a homemaker mom, he grew up with two sisters, yes, one of which was actually named Jane, who inspired the song, The Song That Jane Likes. The Quakers were considered liberal pacifists in South Africa, something that comes to play later in Dave's life. At this time, apartheid was still happening in South Africa, and the family decided to leave for America to raise their children in a less stringent, more multicultural environment. From a young age, Dave's mom, Val, encouraged his interest in music, but it was a tragic turn of events that actually led him to start taking it seriously and really nurturing his talents. When Dave was a young child, his father was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma and would eventually pass away when Dave was 10 years old. Dave's uncle, after whom he's named, said in VH1 documentary Driven how Dave picked up the guitar and started practicing as a way to process his grief. At this time, his mother Val decided to relocate the family to South Africa along with Dave and his two sisters so she could get support from extended family with raising her kids. This would be a formative period for Dave as an artist and a musician. He flunked out of a private school, he went to art school at age 16, traveled around Europe, backpacking and busking, even playing the song that Jane likes on the streets of Amsterdam. He finally ended up back in the States in the musician and artistic hub of Charlottesville, Virginia, known to locals as Seaville, after leaving South Africa to avoid mandatory military service. Picking up work as a bartender at a popular watering hole, Miller's, he was exposed to live music and local musicians on a nightly basis. But instead of soloing themselves, jazz, bluegrass, and rock musicians all went to each other's shows and got inspired by one another. There was also an active Greek life scene and performing at fraternity parties would later become an important part of the band's early success. Originally, Dave pursued acting, being a part of a number of local productions, and you guys might even remember his appearance on the TV show House in 2007, when he played a pianist who gets brain surgery but loses his musical ability, or as Nicole Kidman's husband in the 2011 Adam Sandler movie Just Go With It. He's also appeared on SNL a number of times, and says Bill Hader's impression of him is one of the best. Eventually, a couple of local musicians took him under his wing, letting them jam in their shows. In 1991, he recorded the four-song Carter's Basement demo with sax player Leroy Jones and drummer Carter Beauford, who was Leroy's childhood friend. It included the tracks, the song that Jane likes, Anytime We Stop, The Best of What's Around, and I'll Back You Up. Soon, he'd complete the lineup with other band members, including fiddler Boyd Tinsley and bassist Stefan Lassard and keyboardist Peter Greiser who left the band in March of 1993, shortly before their big break. Dave Matthews would catch the eye of a local manager and club owner, Corn and Capshaw, who got them a regular Tuesday night gig at Trax, which was the major club in Seaville that national acts would pass through when they were in town. The band's first show was on March 14, 1991, as part of a benefit for the Middle East Children's Alliance at the Trax nightclub in Seaville. Fan bootleg recordings from their time playing at Trax are some of the most widely shared. Early on, Capshaw released that live performance and grassroots marketing would end up being the band's ticket to success. Recordings of Dave Matthews Band's shows are heavily circulated, so much so that fans often know the lyrics to songs on albums that hadn't even been released yet. In fact, they were so dedicated to growing by playing live, they'd tour 10 months out of the year, 6 days a week in a cramped 15-seater van. But Dave's voice got so strained that he had to take cortisone shots to the throat just so he didn't miss that night's show. The group's first album would be a live release put out in late 1993 called Remember Two Things and would be released on the small label Bama Rags. Thanks to Dave Matthews Band letting fans record their live shows, word of mouth spread and the album would go platinum, even though it only peaked at number 49 on the charts. Unlike most fledgling bands who were hungry for a contract from a major label, Dave actually feared it. 
He was afraid of giving up publishing rights and creative control so early on in the game. An intern at RCA Records had recorded one of their live shows and passed the demo on to an A&R man. He invited the A&R man to attend a show in New York, and they'd spend the next seven months trying to court the band to sign with RCA by attending tons of their shows and even taking photographs of their live performances to gift the band. They would finally get them on board in 1993. In the 2004 VH1 documentary called Driven, one of the A&R people at RCA talked about why Dave Matthews stood out so much from the other bands at the time, recalling, this was in the period of Nirvana and Pearl Jam, and here was this band on stage without an electric guitar, playing music more powerful than any of those bands I've mentioned. After finally solidifying their lineup and getting signed, little did Dave Matthews' band know that they were about to head into one of the most tumultuous years of their life. Personal tragedy would strike in early 1994 when his older sister was murdered by her husband, who took his own life less than a month later. On the flip side, later that year, the band released 1994's Under the Table and Dreaming, which would be their multi-platinum breakout album and dedicated to his sister. 1996's follow-up album Crash also went multi-platinum. This is the era the most casual Dave Matthews fans probably remember best. In the next seven years, the band released three more multi-platinum albums, and they'd rack up a number of Grammy awards. The 2002 album Busted Stuff was actually challenging for the band to record, because they hit a bit of a creative block and the album just wasn't coming together. Finally, the band's label RCA put them in touch with songwriter and producer Glenn Ballard, best known for co-writing songs with Alanis Morissette. The collection of tracks would end up being leaked on Napster to critical acclaim. 12 recordings became known as Lily White Sessions, and 9 out of the 12 tracks were re-recorded and released on the band's 6th album, 2002's Busted Stuff. The band went on to release five more albums from 2005 to 2023, including two platinum records, 2005 Stand Up and 2009's Big Whiskey and The Groove Grux King, as well as an extensive catalog of live albums, compilation records, and extended plays and video albums. In a 2023 New York Times article, Dave talked about how luck has always played a role in whether or not the band remains popular, saying, it's just what happened to us as much as we've done it. Some worms end up in beautiful, rich, wet soil, and some worms end up on the sidewalk on a hot, sunny day. Dave Matthews' band has always been politically vocal and involved in action. Activism. In 2004, Dave Matthews' band was part of a 34-show, 28-city Vote for Change tour to stand up against protest songs getting no airplay. Although he had previously refrained from supporting any particular candidate in public, in 2004 he strongly came out to support John Kerry and has been publicly involved with the Democratic Party ever since. The band is also committed to giving back and reinvesting in local communities. The band's charity, Bama Works, has raised over $65 million and provided over 6,500 grants for local needs in Seaville and the surrounding communities. Despite all the success and busy touring schedule, Dave Matthews has also made time for personal and family pursuits too. In 1999, Dave bought a 10-acre farm in Virginia and transformed it into a vineyard that produces 5,500 cases of wine per year with unique labels featuring art drawn by himself. In 2000, he married his longtime girlfriend, Dr. Jennifer Ashley Harper, who he's been with ever since the earliest days of the band, and they have twin daughters together and a son. The family lives in Seattle. Despite the band's wholesome image and dedicated fan base, they weren't immune to PR snafus, tragedy, and lineup changes. 2004 tourists passing under the Kinsey Street Bridge in Chicago were about to get the worst surprise of their lives when a Dave Matthews Band tour bus dumped 800 pounds of waste onto the boat's passengers. To try and make up for it, the band donated $50,000 to the Chicago Park District and the bus driver did a year and a half of community service. If you guys want to hear the full story on this, I've done a video on it previously and the link is down below. The band's unusually stable lineup, though, has begun to fracture as well. In June of 2008, 46-year-old sax player Leroy Moore, who was an original band member, was involved in an ATV accident that June. Although he sustained serious injuries, he actually passed away from complications in August a few months later. In 2008 Chicago Tribune online article, it was revealed that Leroy was originally not all that impressed when he first heard Matthew sing and play, which is funny considering how successful they became. Three-time Grammy award-winning saxophonist Jeff Coffin joined the group in 2009 following Leroy's passing. That wasn't the only lineup change that happened in the band's later years. In 2008, keyboardist Butch Taylor, who had been with the band since 1998, left. He didn't give a definitive statement, but implied that touring had taken a personal toll. Then a decade later, in 2018, fiddler Boyd Tinsley was fired from the group after a Seattle area musician made allegations of unwanted sexual advances and comments. About his dismissal, Tinsley took to Twitter to say, I miss you guys and my brothers in the band, but I'm somewhat worn out and need to spend more time with my family and to bring more balance to my life. Thanks for your love, he'd write. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again on Rock Country Story Sticker.